But because of this, it becomes easy for white South Africans, and you cannot blame them, to say that the new government is failing. They cannot deliver to the people. But what they don't know is that the very compromise that keep them in the lap of luxury and giving them a lifestyle that they never dreamed of under the apartheid regime, that very, those very compromises is what is causing the unrest in South Africa. A couple of points here. Before apartheid was, was officially repealed in 1992, which came about after a whites-only referendum, the ANC, through Mandela, had to personally ensure South Africa's re-entry into the world, both economically and on a sporting front. This was achieved by, one, accepting the huge debt purposefully incurred by the apartheid regime to pay off apartheid strongly and so Accepting the boundary lines, spoke about the Waitangi Treaty, which uh, people can now look at historical claims as well. Um, in South Africa, we have what is known as the 1913 Land Act. By 1930, 80% of the land in South Africa was in the hands of colonists. The ANC agreed to the boundary lines of the 1913 Land Act, effectively nullifying their land distribution program, promised land distribution program, while guaranteeing a massive windfall for white landowners in South Africa. They agreed to a process of reconciliation, which was overseen by the TRC, and I'm sure many of you have heard about the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. That TRC ensured that there would be no justice for apartheid victims, and it actually placed the perpetrators of crimes against black South Africans and victims of apartheid and the victims themselves on the same platform. Just a, just a little note here, how, how reconciliation works in South Africa. There's many examples I can cite, but one that always stands out for me is the story of Berkut Seer. Nobody here will know Berkut Seer, but Berkut Seer was a murderer. He would not have been out of place in Auschwitz or Buchenwald. He confessed to the murders of South African uh, activists at the TRC, and he was granted amnesty. Today, Dirk Kutsi is one of our most highest, he's, he's a highly paid security consultant to the ANC government. Now, agreeing to all of these processes ensured that there would be no reparations for victims of apartheid in South Africa, or extra taxes imposed on companies who made millions and billions out of apartheid labor and, and, and oppressive laws. We've seen hidden taxes, such as toll roads, petrol tax, petrol, what it was known in South Africa as a petrol excess tax, property taxes, carbon taxes, electricity power, it's all these sorts of things. And the power elite will have you believe that those negotiations were necessary to avoid a bloodbath in South Africa. However, the life expectancy of a South African is 51. <coughs> and, it, and, and that just tells you that we lead a very hazardous life in South Africa. Millions of South Africans have died since the dawn of, of the student democracy in 1994. We recorded 310,000 deaths in 2009 alone, just from HIV AIDS. We have also recorded 68,000 rapes in 2010, the year of the FIFA World Cup. We have extremely high levels of poverty, violence, and disease, and a rating as the most unequal society in the world. We beat India and Brazil. The only two countries that are higher than us in the violence stakes is uh, Colombia and Mexico because of the drug wars. So I just want to come towards the end here. Now, I know this is a lot of information, and maybe for some people it's a, you know, it's a bit hard to swallow what, some of what I'm saying, but it is true. When I watch this movie here, and I look what New Zealanders put themselves through in this, uh, against the struggle uh, in South Africa, or, or against racism in South Africa, you know, I feel incredibly moved, because I wonder 
we worship these sportsmen. We absolutely worship them. They earn millions every year. But what benefit are they to our to our societies? There was a case in the, the, the Herald, the New Zealand New Zealand Herald of Wednesday, where a businessman in Auckland has got to paint out his, his signage because the company registered in 2010 is called All Black Tides. He is now infringing on something that had belonged to all New Zealanders since 1905, and that is the All Blacks. It's now being taken away from ordinary New Zealanders. And I can identify with that because our country was hijacked last year during the 2010 FIFA World Cup. It even prompted a, a Cape Town businessman to start selling t-shirts which proudly proclaimed Fik Fufa. <laughs> now, now what has happened is we have been duped. We have been we have been bamboozled in the words of Man Malcolm X and we have been sold out. All of us. Never mind just in South Africa. Because as Adolf Hitler once said, the minds of the masses are feeble. If you want to lie, tell big lies and tell it often. And the lie will become imprinted on the minds of the masses. And the lie in South Africa is, not that, is, 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 is that apartheid capital has been liberated. And the pathway into Africa has been liberated and cleared. Not the people who suffered. Because if there's one thing that I learned from the 1981 Springbok uh, tour to New Zealand, and I think it's a lesson almost every government in the world took notice of, which is why none of them wanted the spring box there in, uh, for, for 11 years, more than 11 years, was that people power is real power. But what is happening today is that people, and more especially young people, are disassociated from what is happening in society because they are plugged into their iPads and iPods and all sorts of funny little things. When Beyonce re releases a, D a CD or a DVD today, 10 minutes later there's a promo on TV telling you, including the smash hit so-and-so. How can it be a smash hit that was released 10 minutes ago? <laughs> but if you leave it, we go out and we buy it. We are denying ourselves the ability to think for ourselves. And I think I just want to close with another little quote from my, my favorite statesman, Nelson Mandela, <laughs> which uh, just illustrates the depth of the lie in South Africa. I don't know if you will be able to get hold of this book, but it's a fantastic book. It's the biography of Bill Jardine, a rugby strong man, and incidentally, one of his buddies is in Wellington tonight with the Springbok team. Mark Alexander is the deputy uh, chairperson of the South African Rugby Union. The biography of uh, Bill Jardine, now listen here, that's the name of the book, it's written by Chris Van Blake. In 1997, Nelson Mandela calls all these rugby guys to his office, and he says to them, Gentlemen, I want the Springbok to remain our national sporting emblem. I do know how you feel about it. But we have taken so much away from the white man. Let us, as, at least as a gesture of reconciliation, allow him to keep his Springbok. Thank you. <laughs>